Great, thanks. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Kent Branch March 2022 educational presentation. My name is Cindy Robichaud, and I am part of the Kent Branch operating team and your host for this evening. We'd like to thank you for joining us tonight. Before we begin tonight's presentation, Bob Daly, a member of the Delaware Nation and a member of our Kent Branch, offers a territory acknowledgement. The land on which we gather, learn, and play is the traditional territory of the Atawandaran, Anishinaabek, Haudenosaunee, Lunapawak, and Potawatomi peoples who have long-standing relationships to the land, water, and region of southwestern Ontario. The local First Nations of this area include Chippewa of the Thames First Nation, the Caldwell First Nation, Chippewa of Kettle and Stony Point, Oneida Nation of the Thames, the Delaware Nation at Moravian Town. Sorry, folks. The Muncie Delaware Nation and Wapool Island First Nation. Additionally, there is a growing urban indigenous population who make the cities of southwestern Ontario home. We value the significant historical and contemporary contributions of local and regional First Nations of Turtle Island. Thank you, Bob. We do have a couple of housekeeping items. Our presentations are recorded and available on our Kent Branch YouTube channel, which is open to anyone. Your microphones and cameras have been turned off, but we welcome your questions. If you hover your mouse near the bottom of your screen, you will see the bar with the chat icon. If you click on it, the chat box will open. Here is where you can type your questions or your messages for us or for the speaker, which we will get to at the end of her presentation. Linda Patterson will be monitoring the chat box for us tonight. So thank you, Linda. And since we will be, we will be going live to the Wallaceburg Museum tonight with curator Kaylin Gregory, we, who will be giving us a little tour, we would like you to change your Zoom view so that you can see what she's going to be showing us tonight. So on your Zoom um, screen, at the very top right corner, you should see view. Click on it and another little box will pop up. Change it from the gallery, which is probably set on, to the speaker view. This will make your screen larger so that you'll be able to see what Caitlin will be showing us. Okay, so let's get started. For anyone joining us for the first time, let me tell you a bit about Ontario Ancestors. Ontario Ancestors, also known as the Ontario Genealogical Society, is a nonprofit registered charity which was founded in 1961. It is the largest genealogical society in Canada with a mission to encourage, bring together, and assist those interested in the pursuit of family history and to pre preserve Ontario's genealogical heritage. Be sure to visit the website to learn more about the resources there and the support which is available to assist you in your family history research. Ontario Ancestors has over 30 branches and special interest groups all across Ontario, and we are the Kent branch. We focus mainly on Kent County research and general family history. We offer mentoring, education, and assistance. We hold monthly presentations such as this, and we have a fantastic resource library. Our Family History Resource Library is located on the second floor of the Chatham Kent Public Library in Chatham. It holds 40 years worth of historical and genealogical resources for Chatham Kent. We are open to the public Friday and Saturdays from 1 1 p.m. until 5 p.m. We always like to connect with people interested in genealogy and local history. You can connect with us at this email. You can also join our Kent Branch Facebook group, which has over 700 people who are interested in genealogy and Kent County history. We also have a very comprehensive website with lots of resources, for both our branch members, but also for the public.
Speaking of our website, this is a screenshot of it. Please notice the master name index with currently almost 180,000 entries, which anyone can search. On our website, we share upcoming event information and offer a monthly featured resource. And we switch this out regularly. <clears throat> this section is open to the public as well, so be sure to have a look. We also have one section which is totally dedicated to providing resources and one-of-a-kind material for our branch members to access from their home. This is the members library section, and it is a great benefit to being a Kent branch member. So we do hope you'll stop by our website and browse around and see what you can find. We wish to acknowledge a few of our branch volunteers who received recognition at the Ontario Volunteer Services Awards ceremony last week. These are only a few of our dedicated volunteers that, are work that we are fortunate to have working with us and for us. We could not function without our volunteers. Thank you, Angela, Leslie, John, Calvin, Dorothy and Janet, and to all our other branch volunteers. Maybe you too have some extra time to help us with a, with a project. We have so many different projects on the go all the time that you could assist with right from your home. Indexing, transcribing, or editing can all be done from the comfort of your home and with very little commitment. For example, last week we digitized a couple small booklets of the history of Dresden. So now that they're digitized, we need a volunteer who would index these. Each of these little booklets are no more than 90 pages and we supply all the index indexing instructions and a template. There is no time frame for this. If you would like to give it a try and if you enjoy it, great. And if you try it and it's not for you, that's okay too. We have lots of other things. If you would like to give it a try or want to know more, please send an email to kent at ogs.on.ca. There are some upcoming events which would be of interest to family historians. If you use Family Tree Maker or are just interested to know more about Family Tree Maker, the program, then the Family Tree Maker user group might be of interest to you. This is an, atten an attendee driven drop in style chat where people ask questions and share information about their experiences with Family Tree Maker. The sessions are free and anyone can attend. You just simply need to register. The next session is. March 29th at 7 p.m. And a link to register can be found on our Kent Branch website. Then on April 8th, we are pleased to welcome representatives from the Federated Women's Institutes of Ontario who happen to be celebrating 125 years of supporting women in Ontario and around the world. Many of us are familiar with the Tweedsmer history books and the wealth of information they captured and preserved of local community history. These books are a goldmine of information for family historians. And Irene will be joining us and she will be discussing the Women's Institute, their digital collections, and the Tweedsmere books for Kent County. You can register to attend this presentation on our website as well, or even in our Facebook group. And we really hope that you join us. Now let's get to tonight's presentation, Drop In at the Wallaceburg Museum with Kaylin Gregory, the curator. When Kaylin was in high school, she was part of an experimental learning course where she basically went to school in the local museum for a semester. From then on, she knew that she wanted to be a local curator at home. So she studied history at McMaster University. And when she graduated, she went on to take museum and gallery studies at Georgian College. 
Kaylin worked briefly at the Base Borden Military Museum, that's a mouthful, before coming the curator at the Wallaceburg Museum. So let's welcome Kaylin. Thank you for letting us drop in on you. And I know you have lots of things to show us, so I'll let you get started. There is also going to be a handout available and we'll put that in the chat box. It is a listing of all the great resources that the museum has that would be of interest to family historians. So I will stop sharing, let Caitlin take it away. Amazing, thank you so much for the introduction, Cindy. And hello to everyone else. It's, I know we can't really see each other, but uh, I'm glad to be doing this for you guys tonight. Um, so I am currently inside the Wallaceburg Museum, um, but the internet does not allow me to actually walk around and show you some of the stuff that we have. Um, so the first thing I wanna do is just take you through a virtual kind of tour of uh, what we got. And then I'll stop sharing and I kind of want to show you around the research room, which is also my office and um, some of the stuff here that you guys might be interested in digging into something. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and start doing uh, the presentation, sorry. Okay, so what is in the Wallaceburg Museum? I know maybe some of you haven't been able to get out before at all, or maybe not in a while since the pandemic, um, but I will show you. So typically the first thing you see when you walk into the Wallaceburg Museum will be our glass gallery. So. Wallaceburg is known for being the glass capital of Canada. And ever since the inception of the museum, from what I've seen in the records, uh, people have been bringing their proud Wallaceburg glass to us here for our collection. And uh, when the glass factory actually closed in the 2000s, the glass that they had left over was literally brought to us by the truckload. Um, so we have, Lots and lots of glass, especially in Glass Valley. Um, one of my favorite pieces of glass are actually these retirement bottles that were given to Dominion Glass workers um, upon their retirement. Um, they once held liquor. <laughs> I can't say for sure what happened to that, um, but now they're in our collection and I just think they're phenomenal. Um, so if you walk through the glass gallery, you'll also see this is one of my favorite artifacts personally. And I have to show it to you guys because I just put a physical display in of it. But this is glass that has actually been made with uranium as the main um, color agent. So when you put a um, UV light over it, it will glow in the dark, essentially. Um, I also borrowed a Geiger counter from my friends at the Sport and Military Museum and had some fun lighting up that thing to see how radi radioactive it was. Um, surprisingly, it's it's quite safe to, uh, to be around, to look at in a museum, to handle. Um, I wouldn't recommend eating off any of the glass pieces, but it does your cell phone in your pocket actually puts off more uh, radiation than these pieces do, but they're very neat. So once you've walked past and through the glass gallery, the next area in the museum would be the Sports Hall of Fame. So I think one half of this room would be more interesting to genealogists. Uh, it actually highlights all the Sports Hall of Famers, and unfortunately, the way I took the picture, you can't see it, but there is an actual touch screen just around one of the corners there. Um, and you can go there and search alphabetically by last, last name, anyone who is in the Sports Hall of Fame, and you can get a little bit more information about uh, what they did and a little bit more about their, their lives as well, which is quite interesting. So if you've gone through the Sports Hall of Fame, your next stop on the, uh, the current path we have set up in the museum would be a walk down historic James Street. So on James Street, we highlight a lot of the local businesses. Um, 
mainly the local family businesses that were um, on James Street back in the day. So uh, the main one in the front of the picture here is uh, Caldwell's store. And then we have Shaw's Hardware down at the back. Um, Brander's Pharmacy is also highlighted and um, Central School and O'Flynn and Burgess uh, store as well. Among some other little hidden gems, I wouldn't want to give too much away here. And I can't show historic James Street without showing this beautiful painting. Um, I'm sure if you've been to Hollisburg, you recognize the building. And this was actually done by one of our volunteers who uh, still puts in quite a few hours here every week. So I just like to show off this piece and appreciate it. I think he did an amazing job. His name is uh, Jim Mulgrew, for those of you who don't know. He's a phenomenal artist. And we're actually having him in our art gallery in August this year. So you should definitely come and check it out. And we turn the corner off of James Street and we get into the Marine Room. And uh, I just love the mural in this room, first of all. It's uh, pretty accurate for the most part if you came and looked closely at some of the buildings. Um, they are named local businesses or uh, local landmarks have been put into this mural. Um, and the rest of the room, uh, we have the steamer Annette here on the left. Um, what they were able to recover of it eventually. Um, and we have our captain and we talk more about um, some of the races that happened, um, some of the motors, some of the big boats that used to come up and down through Wallaceburg. And um, there's a little slideshow in there as well, you can see. In the industry room, <laughs> there is too much to show in the industry room and in just a couple pictures here. Um, but we do, Wallaceburg was built on industry and Wallaceburg had a ton of really phenomenal industry in the area. Um, so for one was Heinz and you can see our very large ketchup bottle in here. Uh, that's always a crowd pleaser. It's made out of uh, soup cans, tomato soup cans. Um, we highlight the stave mills and the lumber industry, uh, the glass, of course, um, the presto cooker, and um, some of the other bigger industries that were in the area, not just the businesses. And of course, we would have to talk about Wallaceburg Brass in the industry room. And um, if you didn't already know, we do have the largest, the world's largest faucet in the Wallaceburg Museum. It's one of two that were made by Wallaceburg Brass in the 1920s. Um, and if you come to the museum, you can see on the right, there is a button you can press to uh, turn on the, the, the faucet. So then you can say that you have uh, turned on the world's largest faucet, the Wallaceburg Museum. So after the industry room, you would be heading downstairs into our Legion room. Um, the room pretty well speaks for itself. It's uh, been designed to honor and appreciate some of the sacrifices that our local veterans have made. Um, the other really interesting part of this room in the back there, uh, we have a collection of Lee Enfield rifles and we actually have the first Lee Enfield rifle um, in the collection. And coming from Base Board and Military Museum, I think that's pretty phenomenal because they actually used them in the armed forces until 2018. They were using hundred and something year old rifles. So it's a pretty cool story. And just off of the Legion room, you can find our 20s, 30s kitchen and parlor. Um, we have, I'll we'll say circa 20s. We haven't quite pinned down the exact date we're aiming for, um, but there's lots of neat things to see and hear and hear. And also in our basement is our Baldoon rooms. Um, so there's kind of two dedicated rooms to the Baldoon settlement and the 15 families that came here originally. Um, the first room depicts kind of uh, pioneer life and it's this room here. And the second room, if you have not been here, I don't want to give too much away, but basically it's an immersive experience of uh, 
life on the Baldoon settlement and specifically the uh, the Baldoon mystery. So you can come in here, um, press a button. It's a great interactive experience and you get to hear a little bit about what the Baldoon mystery was all about. Um, and the picture on the right here might be one of our largest artifacts. Um, it is a loom. Um, I want to say it still operates. Don't hold me to that. I've never tried, but um, that's a pretty incredible piece that we have down there. So when I was talking to Cindy about doing this presentation, I kind of mentioned this room in passing and uh, she seemed to get quite excited by it. So I'm hoping as genealogists, you guys will love this room. I love this room. There are secret doors all along the museum walls as you're walking through. This one is smack in the middle of the glass gallery actually. And uh, at first glance, it's not much, but this is actually our vault. And within the vault is where we store the entirety of our photograph collection. So all of our photographs are in those gray archival boxes. I'm sorry it looks like a messy room, but I swear it's very organized. Um, we also have some of our more fragile newspapers that should be handled. Um, they are stored in here, um, rare books, that, that sort of thing. Um, this room is not open to the, the public, but if you guys ever wanted to um, inquire about photographs or um, see what we had in there, work with some of them, um, definitely reach out to me and we can figure something out. So if you uh, would like to get involved at all, um, I'm gonna shamelessly <laughs> add that we always need volunteers. We uh, always, need some more help in here. We can always have jobs for a million different skills. Um, so if you in the Wallaceburg area, you got some extra time, please, please, please reach out to me. Um, and I'm, I'm going to show this slide again, probably at the end. So if you don't get all the information, don't worry. Um, but to use our research room, which I'll talk about next, usually I tell people it's available on upon appointment. I would love it if, um, you know, just send me an email, call me, say, hey, I want to come in the research room this day. Um, that being said, usually we can accommodate drop-ins. Um, we're not totally busy all the time, but we do like to have someone here to work with you while you're in the research room. Um, so just letting us know. Uh, it's completely free to use uh, the research room and any of the material in here and our scanner. Um, we just ask a donation is left for the museum and there is a fee to use um, our printer if you need an ink for any reason, but free for everything else. Um, and I put the museum phone number there and my email. And we are open from Tuesday to Saturday from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. So, I'm sorry if I went very fast. <laughs> I wanted to leave tons of time for questions. So, um, that was great. <laughs> and I do have some questions for you, Kayla. And this one comes from Sherry. Oh. Okay. She wants to know do you have any photos from Neil Cromwell Gibson? He started his first photography in Wallaceburg and then moved over to Chatham. That is something I will write down to look up. <laughs> Most things in the collection I'm still getting used to um, finding and understanding that yes, we, that is something we have. Um, so I will definitely make a note of that and maybe I'll look it up. Can we can we get her email or? Okay. Yeah, we have I will a send you an email. <laughs> then I have another message from Jean. And she wants to know what was the Baldoon settlement? Who were their families and when did they arrive? So the Baldoon settlement was um, the it was the start of Wallaceburg, basically. Um, so there was a lord in Scotland, Lord Skelk Selkirk. Um, and after some tumultuous times in Scotland, they decided to come to Canada. So uh, basically, he got 15 families on a boat and sailed to what is now Wallaceburg and um, set up a settlement. And the settlement was known to have a lot of hardships. It moved a couple of times. Um, there was malaria and 
not always um, success. Then they moved it and then they started being successful. And the, the 15 families, um, I have a list of all the names of the first settlers, um, but they're all McDougal's and McDonald's and um, Mc somethings. <laughs> so yeah, it's quite so, an interesting story. And the Caitlin, would, would that list be on the handout that uh, that information that you provided? Would the list nope. of the families be on that list? I don't think so, but I have. Um, okay. I can send that to you. Okay, great. And the so handout it. is in the chat box if uh, people want to download it. Yeah, and just to, to touch on that some more, um, the Baldoon mystery is, it's been recorded for years and years about um, strange, spooky occurrences that have been happening. We tell the story a lot at Halloween, and um, there's a black goose and a witch, and it's it's a fantastic story. So if you ever get a chance to look it up, you should. <laughs> Another question is, and this one's from Cindy, she wants to know, what is the oldest artifact in the museum? Oldest? I think it would probably be some of our newspapers. We have Wallaceburg Heralds from the late 1800s. Oh. Um, but we also have, oh, no, that's a lie. We have Baldoon. We have Baldoon artifacts. <laughs> Early 1800s, we have um, a collection of things that a gentleman actually found with a um, metal detector and had dug them up and figured out that they were Baldoon, you know, musket balls. And I think we have a sad iron that could have been from Baldoon and um, some tools and buttons and things like that. Another question, Terry wants to know, is there a cost to go in? Yes, so it's $3 per person, um, $2 for a senior, um, $7 for a family. So I think it's, it's four people that we say is a, a family. Um, and if you came in and, and you didn't want to tour the museum, but you did just want to see our art gallery or you had an appointment with me or something, um, then that's free because we have a new local artist in every month. So we try and encourage people to come in and, and see the local art so we don't charge if you're only viewing the art gallery. I have a question from Jane. She wants to know, did any of you know Al Mann? He founded your museum and his father, Frank Mann, was a huge historian in Wallaceburg. Yes, I wish I could say I knew him. <laughs> I have been, every time I had a question or I didn't understand something because I'm a new person to Wallaceburg, Al Mann in these files somewhere has answered my questions. And um, luckily, Ariel Mann still volunteers here. Um, I would say she works full-time hours. <laughs> she is incredible. She has helped me get used to this job and she knows, she basically lives inside Al's head. So. Yeah, I, I do use his work a lot, yep. <laughs> and Leslie wants to know, what is the address for the Wallaceburg Museum? Off the top of my head, it's 505 King Street, I believe, Wallaceburg. And Julie wants to know, she is surprised that there's no mention of Jean Gordon or her family. Thought there was a separate area just devoted to her. How did I not do that? That's right. There, we also have the uh, Jean Gordon Theatre, which is the other half of the museum. Um, it has its own entrance. Uh, that's pretty phenomenal to see too. We have a, a staircase and someone has uh, painted a frame around this huge, gorgeous picture of Jean Gordon. Um, so yes, there is the, the, the theatre is still upstairs and, and you are able to go up and, and look at it if you wanted to see it. Jane has a question. She wants to know, my grandfather was Alexander Brander, who founded Brander's Drugstore in 1888. His yeah. son, Alan Brander, became mayor of Wallaceburg in the 1940s. Brander Park was named after him. My parents met him at Port Lambton when my dad was working on construction paving the streets in Wallaceburg about 1912. Very cool. Yep, 
you got to come see our Branders Pharmacy uh, display then. We have a lot of uh, Branders Branders branded objects <laughs> in our collection. And I just had a question. Are you handicapped accessible? Yes. We have uh, elevators to go up and down from both the theater half of the building and the display half of the building. That's it for the questions for right now. Fantastic. So I will show you now the research room. Um, again, if you ever want to use um, any of the information we have in here, you can send me an email, call the museum, show up whenever we're open. I'm here usually. So um, I'll start first with the handout that Cindy had mentioned. Um, we have a copy here. The Wallaceburg Museum Vertical Files Guidebook. And basically, if you ever want to know um, something, you would go to our index first. And this was Ariel Mann who did this. Um, so that will tell you everything that is in the files behind me here. So um, if you want to know about industries or businesses, citizens, that's all in here in our vertical files. And basically you would say, Kaylin, I want to know about this. And then I would basically pull that file for you. You can work at whatever desk we have available um, and you're free to thumb through it and, and see what we have there. Um, and then above me, above our vertical files, those are our genealogical files, and we actually just recently got this entire shelf of genealogy um, binders digitized. So it's not available online per se, but if you did have a name or um, a specific something you wanted me to send you from there, um, super easy, I can do it in five minutes. <laughs> so that's very exciting for me because uh, less, less looking around. Um, and then just to this, these three here are the fonds. Um, so this, depending on how, what kind of shape the fonds are in, um, it'll kind of be up to whoever's working with you um, if, if they can be handled or not. Because um, what we store in the fonds is more um, primary source material. It's typically a little bit older, a little bit more fragile, um, but it can be scanned and, and sent out just the same as the rest of our stuff. Um, and this is the Frank Mann Research Room. That's what it says on the door. So we do have all of the Mann historical files available here in a filing cabinet. Um, so all the pictures, all the stories, all the everything that they gathered over the years we have here in that filing cabinet, um, as well as when we come across things that would fit in the vertical files, uh, what we do is we photocopy or scan them and we make sure it's in multiple places. So if you're here, you're not looking all day for one thing, basically. And more from the man files. Um, I don't know if anyone is familiar with the book, uh, No Return Ticket that Alan had written, but in this black filing cabinet, available for you guys. We have all the uh, World War I and World War II casualties. Um, for the World War I guys, we have all their service records. I think we might have some for the World War II. Um, and then we have uh, a lot of collections of negatives and scrapbooks and other things in these and the other, <laughs> the other filing cabinets. And just going to walk you around here. Behind me is the newspaper collection. So it takes up two walls <laughs> in the whole of the room. Um, so it is very extensive. Some of this, again, is more handleable than others. Um, so just depending on how old the paper is, how badly it's it's maintained its composure over the years. Um, they can be handled, they can be scanned, thumbed through. But uh, Henry Van Heeren, our historical society president, is going through the process to make the collection 
available digitally. Um, and then we're hoping to put the physical collection away so that we can better preserve them and no one has to touch them again. And these actually go all the way back to, I think 1896 is our earliest. And they are Wallaceburg News, uh, Courier Press, Weekender. And I thought we had a couple of another one, but that's it. And then we also have some Wallsburg Heralds, as I mentioned, but that's a pretty sporadic collection. <laughs> so it would be hard to look for a specific date on that. Um, and I'll take you over. Hey, Lynn. Yes. Before you leave the newspapers, Sherry's wondering uh -huh. if the newspapers are the same ones that are in the Wallsburg Library. They may have a more complete collection, I hate to say. Um, what we are digitizing, we are actually using the, the, um, the library's microfiche collection to make PDFs from. Because if yeah, you can kind of see, over my head is 1896 to about 1920, except it's 1896, 1898, 1912, 1918, kind of... It jumps, so we don't have a full collection as far back as it goes. Um, so that's why Henry's using the library's collection. <laughs> yeah. Um, where was I going? Yes. This way. So this is our little little scanning desk. Henry set me up a little shelf um, if I was ever scanning something larger. Um, I'm pretty sure we copied the scanner from the scanner that the Genealogical Society has. So nothing fancy, nothing different really. Um, if you ever need something scanned or you find something in the files, that's really fantastic. And um, we can scan that for you. If you have a memory stick, we can put it there. I can email it to you, print it off, whatever, whatever needs to happen. Um, and then we have some books. They're more, um, like reference material, I guess. So a lot of things, there's like glass, um, some antique books, things that um, we kind of use more when we're looking at things in the collection rather than um, things that I think would really be useful as genealogists. Um, but yeah, I think that's pretty well the research room. Again, it's totally free to use and um, I'm here all the time, so give me an email. <laughs> Let me know what you need. <laughs> I have another question from Lorne. He wants to, he states that Henry said the library has some of the museum books on loan. Um, some of the, sorry, some of the museum books? Said the library has some of the museum books on loan. It, it's possible. Um, they might have some of our books. That's what he's saying is. Was there any other questions at all or? None so far. Okay, awesome. So um, you gave me that little um, tidbit about the vault when we were talking earlier. Um, I don't know if people recall, but time flies so fast, but three, four, maybe five years ago, um, we had taken an actual physical tour um, which was wonderful, um, very much enjoyed it. Um, and we did not see the vault. So when Kaylin said, have you seen it? I was like, no, what is, what's in the <laughs> vault? That's awesome. So is there any, um, and maybe I missed if you said this, is there any plans to digitize all the material that are in the vault or is it already digitized? It's actually already digitized. <laughs> I can actually say, yes, we have that one done. <laughs> yes. Um, so basically everything in the museum is assigned an accession number, um, but we do it interesting here where the photos get an accession number and a P number. That's a number that just starts with a P. Um, so I can look in our files, like our catalog on, on the computer, um, keyword, whatever you're looking for, find the P number and then go to the vault and get the physical photo very easily, or I can get, um, the digitized version very easily as well. Yeah. So if somebody has, they went through the handout and they said, oh, the Smith family, they have stuff on the Smith family. I know that's very general. Um, so what would be the process? They would maybe shoot you an email and say, I see that you have Benjamin Smith 
Um, and so then what would be the process? Yeah, so um, basically I like it when I get as much information as possible. Um, so if you sent me an email and said, tell me more about the glass house, I would be like, can you be specific? <laughs> So uh, definitely, if you're emailing, that's easiest, um, you know, specific details, even things you already know, like helpful little clues is always good. I like to know uh, what you know and what you would like to know. Um, and then, yeah, you can either email me, uh, curator at kent.net. I'll put it up. Maybe I'll put it in the chat in a minute. Um, and then, or you can call the museum if emailing is not your thing. Um, you'll probably get our front desk person. If I'm in my office, uh, she'll give me a call and I can talk, talk to you through it a little bit, or um, she'll take your message and then I can get back to you. It's all, it, however you want to <laughs> get your information to me. You know, call me, email me, come to the museum. It's, it's pretty easy. So, and then do you have a, a set, um, I guess, list of resources that would you would go for if you were looking for, you know, Benjamin Smith? Would you, you know, you look in the family histories, then in the, the fronds, and then in the photos, and then in the newspapers, like how extensive? And then I believe you had said that, um, that donations uh, are a, a way of, you know, paying it forward to the museum for doing those lookup services. Yeah, so um, usually my process is the first thing I will go to is um, what I had sent you, and I'll see what we have available. Um, sometimes you got to get a little creative around here with where things are, though, so then I start looking in the same vertical files kind of places where it could be, but maybe not. Um, then I actually forgot to mention one of our um, services, but we also have um, our man kept a scrapbook of every story that he ever wrote and he compiled them all and indexed them all. And then we had someone, this was years and years ago, so we paid someone to digitize those. Um, so I also have every story ever written by Al man and Frank man, actually, he wrote too when he was around. Um, so we have all of those. That's where I would go next. <laughs> he wrote a lot of stories about a lot of important things. Um, then usually if there's a family history like that that name sticks out um there's pretty large family histories here that's usually the same names reoccurring um but then i would start looking in our past perfect catalog i don't know if you're familiar with the program but um you can keyword the whole collection there and it it seems like that would be a great place to start except <laughs> you get everything that's in this place so it would take a little longer um, but I don't usually stop until I know that there's not, nowhere else I can look. Hey, great. Kaylin, uh, Jean has a question. She says, my mother's godmother was Jean Wallace from Wallaceburg. I'm curious about the family. I live in Kingston and have never been to Wallaceburg. So what are your suggestions? Um, definitely send me an email. I just wrote down the name as well because I'm going to start looking maybe tomorrow. Um, but if, yeah, if you want to call the museum tomorrow, I work from 8.30 to 4.30 uh, or you can send me an email or, you know, obviously don't drive to the museum tomorrow, but <laughs> call me or email me and I'll, I'll try and figure that out for you. And Sherry has a question. She wants to know what are the COVID restrictions right now for the museum? Uh, right now, we are following what the um, province is saying. So um, we're not checking vaccine passports at the door, but we are expecting visitors to wear masks. And it's not usually busy, so capacity limits, I don't even, I don't know. <laughs> so Caitlin, can you uh, touch on, you know, do you have any, um, cemetery records um, or burial records or church records that do house any of that sort of stuff? Absolutely. Um, so Henry, again, <laughs> Henry's amazing. Henry has a very extensive uh, cemetery database and that is available um, on our research computer here um, as well as our, our shared drive throughout the whole museum. So basically you can come in here and 
um, search up any plot number, any name. Um, I think he has cause of death for a lot of people. Um, you can search that up and, and find. Yeah. And then he also has maps attached to that. So you can go and see actually where in the cemetery that plot actually is. So I, I'm pretty, I think he's very caught up with it. I don't think there's too much missing from that collection for the Riverview Cemetery. Um, and then this is in the process of being digitized. So I had to go looking for it, but oh, you can't even see it. It says churches. <laughs> we have a whole bunch of binders on local churches. And Al also took a ton of pictures of all the local churches. And that's what I happened to be digitizing last week. So um, yeah, lots of lots on buildings in Wallaceburg, um, churches, businesses, industry, old houses. Um, yeah, we, we got a lot in here. <laughs> And that leads to a question from Jack. He wants to know, what's the history of the building housing the museum? So, um, it's a really cool, crazy kind of fun history, I guess. Um, originally, there was a town hall that was put here. Um, and when conversations were happening about building a town hall in Wallaceburg, um, there was a bunch of important businessmen who wanted it on the north side of, of town because um, that was closer to where they lived and Captain Steinhoff pretty well individually wanted it on the south side of town. So they decided it was going to be on the north side. They put all the building materials on the north side of town and then Captain Steinhoff grabbed everyone that he knew that had a horse and buggy in the cover of darkness, rode across town, stole all the building materials and put them <laughs> here. <laughs> and then this is where town hall was built. <laughs> they called another meeting and they said, okay. Um, so a town hall was built here and then it, eventually it was torn down and um, a hydro building was built. And that is what the museum is today. So actually over our front door is the original Wallaceburg Hydro um, stone. And then this building, this research room is actually the research building. Um, and it's been connected to the main building by a hallway. Um, but it was a hydro station and um, substation. And then actually the theater was part of the t original town hall. It was an opera house. And when Hydro kind of bought the land, said we're gonna destroy it, rebuild, um, it was done so with the understanding that there would still be a theater over there. <laughs> so it's pretty cool, pretty cool little story. That is truly the, the quote, um, it's better to you know ask for uh, forgiveness than permission. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It worked. He got what he wanted. So. <laughs> yep. so you mentioned your website. Um, are there resources um, that have been digitized already on your website that people can access? And, and if not, I see you're shaking your head no. Um, is that something <laughs> coming down the line, do you feel? It might be a multi-year project, I would say. Um, right now, there, I feel like there's so many really important steps we need to take in between digitizing and making available to the public. Um, like we wanna get these guys, the newspapers digitized and we wanna put them away. Um, there's a basement underneath this office and we're, um, we're restoring it into becoming like a operating climate controlled, super safe uh, archive space. So, um, kind of working on all these things all at once and then there's artifacts stored down there so I've been working on getting them somewhere else <laughs> so I, it, it's going to be a long project but uh, I'm nitpicking at it every time there's a research request I scan it gets saved and, and organized and then I can I can send it out to the world that way so trying to make it as available as possible right so would that be something that you know you had mentioned and it's the same as us we're always looking for volunteers um, is that something that you could envision a volunteer would be capable of assisting with? Absolutely. Yeah. Great. Yep. We, uh, we would love our volunteers to, if there's something you enjoy doing and you come to us and say, I have this skill and I enjoy doing it, we, we generally try and find a job that suits that skill. 
So what if um, somebody had, so moving away sort of from the family history and the paper side of it, what if somebody had a family heirloom or um, an artifact um, that came from Wallaceburg? Um, are you accepting donations? And, what it, and if you are, what is the process for that? So um, we're kind of always accepting donations, kind of like an open door. Um, come in, show me what you got, tell me what you know about it kind of idea. Um, and then once it walks in the door, we have you sign a donor form. Um, basically just gives us your information and says that I am donating this to the museum with no conditions and it's yours now. Um, but we don't actually file that donor form right straight away. So we'll take it down to our processing room and we'll do more research on it. Um, so we try and look, is it something that we already have a lot of in the collection? Is it better than the ones we already have in the collection or worse? Or is it the same teacup, but it belonged to someone special? Like all that, that mm -hmm. kind of takes the most time <laughs> right now. It's a very big place with a big collection. Um, and then we, we kind of sort it out from there and then we'll decide if, yes, we're gonna accession this into the collection or no. Um, and usually I'll ask when they walk in, um, what do you want done with this if we don't want it? Because mm -hmm. more often than not, it's someone cleaning out a basement or a garage and they happen to pawn it and they were gonna throw it out, but then they brought it to us kind of thing. So usually they say like, throw it out, take it to the gift or the, the thrift store. Sometimes people will um, allow us to sell in our gift shop, which is fantastic because we won't, well, well, we can't do that with artifacts. We're never going to sell them in our gift shop. So when they come in and we don't need them, it's a cool way to make some more money for the museum. Um, or we call if you want it back. Um, that I do that too. Yeah. Sometimes people want it returned to the family if we don't want it. So that's totally fine as well. That's, yeah, whatever. Okay, great. Yeah. Another question came in from Jack. He wants to know, do you know what happened to the tombstones? to the old Water Street Cemetery? I do not, but I can also check on that. <laughs> not off the top of my head, no. I'm sure if Henry was here, he would, he would tell me like this, so. <laughs> I wonder if, um, if Jack could type in, does he know anything further about them? And yeah, so Henry has also shared um, his database, the cemetery database um, with us. Um, okay. So generous. Uh, he wants it out there in the public. He has yes. done years and years of meticulous work going through all the newspaper, just tons of work. So he showed up one day with a USB stick, introduced himself, <laughs> who he was, and gave it to us. And it's amazing. <laughs> so we have the same thing. We have it on our um, public um, computers that anybody can come in and access. So He's done so much work. He's a great, great guy. And I actually think he has a, uh, a Facebook group um, or Facebook page for himself. Um, I'll have to go look for that. And uh, he had some information on there too. Neat. But yeah, it was very generous of him to do that. And I know he's still working at it. So yes, that man works very hard around here. <laughs> if you come to the research room, you'll probably see Henry into something. <laughs> Kaylin, Sherry wants to know, do you have any old maps of Wallaceburg? Do I ever? <laughs> I got survey maps, I got hand-drawn maps, I got aerial pictures. Um, actually, I'll take you over there. And they all span all different years. I actually just got a cloth map um, of Wallaceburg. Oh, so wow. this, it's much taller than I is our map cabinet. <laughs> um, so it is, it, it's full. Yes, we have lots of maps and area, not just Wallaceburg maps. Uh, we have some railroad maps and some other uh, different style maps as well. Excellent. Mm. Forgot to show the map cabinet. <laughs> and it's locked, but I'm always in here. I have the key. If you're looking for something specific, I can definitely make it accessible especially if you call ahead. <laughs> Great. Yeah. I don't know, I don't see any more questions. You must have answered everyone's questions. 
Well, that was wonderful. And I know that because of COVID and the restrictions the last two years, we haven't been able to, you know, get out to the favorite museums and historical societies and, you know, in small places like that. So this was wonderful that you allowed us and you took the time to be with us on Friday night. So just, <laughs> sure I work Saturdays, so it's, it's really only Thursday night. Um, so I'm sure um, that it's not usually a time that you're in there. So no. hopefully, there's, hopefully there's no tricky hauntings going on in there while you're there alone by yourself on Friday night. Well, I was quite pleased when other people started showing up. I felt better. <laughs> it's definitely a little creepy crawly being in the museum alone at night. But. Exactly. Night at the museum, eh? <laughs> exactly. Oh, speaking of, we have Night of the Museum playing on one of our movie nights coming up. We have movie yeah. nights upstairs in the Jean Gordon Theater. Um, and it's usually Monday or Tuesday nights. Um, so if you're interested in that, it's $3 and we have concessions and it's a fun time. Yeah, and I, I will say um, from our tour a few years ago, I had no idea how big the museum is. It's literally, what, three, four floor? Like, it was just... Yeah, it, it's huge, and you have so much in there for Wallaceburg. So yeah, if anybody has an opportunity to stop in and actually go through the museum, it is well worth it. So it's a, it's a great day tripper, or put it on your to do list, um, yep. and go for a visit. So it's wonderful. Yeah, lots of people are saying thank you and great job. So yeah, thank you guys for having me, and I'll do it again. This was fun. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Yeah. Okay, well, we won't keep people um, past eight o'clock, and I know it's just a couple minutes before. So thanks again for joining us. Really informative. Linda, thanks for taking all the questions. Uh, Steve was in the background helping with uh, managing things. So thanks, everyone, who made tonight possible, and we will see you at the next presentation in April. Goodbye, everybody. Good night. Night.